Lord, we thank you and praise you this morning for your word. And I ask, Lord, that you would open our hearts to receive what you have for us today. Lord, touch my lips to speak your word in a manner that we can understand. Give us understanding, Lord, that we would leave this place changed, different than we came in. Because we know that your word transforms us. We thank you for that, Jesus, in your wonderful name. Amen. Amen. My message today is titled Eternal Life. This is Easter. And we know all the story. We know the trappings of Easter, the celebration. Sadly, Easter has become more of a secular holiday than what it's meant to be. It's meant to be the celebration of Christ rising from the dead. And it's because he has risen, because he conquered death, that we have eternal life. It wasn't enough for him to die on the cross. He had to die on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. But he also had to conquer death so that we could have eternal life. Jesus rose from the dead because the grave could not hold him. Because he was sinless. He had to come back to life. Because the Bible tells us the wages of sin is death. And because he had no sin, he did not suffer the wages of sin. He came back to life to conquer death for all of us. John chapter 5, 25 to 29 says, Most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Everyone is going to rise from the dead. Those that die on earth, unless you're here when he returns and you're taken to be with him alive, you will die and you will be resurrected. Tells us you're either going to be resurrected to life or you're going to be resurrected to condemnation. There's only two choices. A lot of people today say, well, everybody's going to go to heaven. Everybody's going to see Beulah Land that we sang about, that beautiful place. Well, that's not what Christ taught. That's not what the scriptures teach. Yes, we will all have eternal life. But some will have eternal life in condemnation. Some will have eternal life with God in paradise. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection of life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? I asked you that same question today. Do you believe this? what Easter is all about, what the resurrection is all about, is eternal life. And if you don't believe that, then it's a sad state to be in. I feel bad for people that say, well, I just believe that when I die, I'm just going to push up daisies. There's nothing after life. Well, then what are you, what are you living for? What is your purpose? It seemed like, to me, if I didn't know that I had eternal life, that I didn't know I had something better to look forward to, I couldn't get through some days. Some days things just aren't that great here on earth. Because sin has come into this earth. It's a corrupted place. It's not what God meant it to be. It's a difficult place to be. Especially right now. Well, I just go to the gas station, I get depressed. <laughs> My little car, I love that little car because I used to be able to fill it up for under $20. It cost me $60 now to fill that car up. It's ridiculous. That's depressing. 
But when I feel depressed, I just find myself in heaven. I don't have to worry about the price of gas. Because I can get it wherever I want to go just with a thought. Because, because Christ rose from the dead, there is a resurrection for us. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians 15 a little bit here. It's a great chapter on the resurrection, our resurrection. Now, if Christ is preached and he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? See, even back right after Christ had died and rose from the dead, there were people that were denying that there was a resurrection for us. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and our faith is also empty. Mark mentioned briefly this morning just the, the evidence that there is, that this is a historic event, that Christ rose from the dead. It is not a story. It is not a fable. It's not a fairy tale. There are many very learned men that have, men that have looked into it, studied it, and tried to disprove it and all they came up with is that it's a fact of history that they can't explain. There are eyewitnesses to the account, not just in the, in the Gospels. There are also historians of the time that wrote about it. It was an event that took place that many did not understand. But we understand it because we have God's Word. So yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up. So if you're testifying that God raised up Christ and you don't believe in the resurrection, then you are giving a false testimony. Because how can you believe he raised if there is no resurrection for anybody? In fact, the dead do not rise, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ has not risen. And I just have to stick with me as I read. Paul was, uh, just to help you out, you haven't read a lot of Paul's writings, Peter said Paul was very weighty. <laughs> he didn't explain things just in the simplest terms. He liked to come at it from many different directions to make sure you got it. And if Christ has not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. And also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life... Only we have hope in Christ. We are all men, the most pitiful. We don't have that hope, that promise of a resurrection. We're pitiful. We are, said men, the most pitiful. What is there to look forward to? Jesus was the first fruit of the resurrection. He was the first fruit of the resurrection so that we can all be raised. Did you know that today is the Feast of First Fruits? It happened this year that Passover fell on the same weekend as Easter. They're usually not lined up because we're on different calendars. <clears throat> the Jewish calendar is different than the Roman calendar that we go by. And so our dates don't always... But this, this year they lined up. So this is the Feast of First Fruits. Jesus rose on the feast of first fruits. And not only that, when he rose, it said graves opened in Jerusalem, and many of the dead rose. He brought forth a first fruit offering as well of the resurrection. And it said these arose from the dead, presented themselves to the priests. That's what you do with the first fruit offering. The first fruit was the first bar of the barley harvest. They would harvest a sheep of barley that was ready, harvest the best that they could get out of the field, and they would bring it as an offering, the first fruit offering of the harvest. Jesus is the first fruit offering of the resurrection. Everything that happened, if you read the stories, happened in God's perfect timing. God set it all up from the very beginning. That's what's so amazing about the scriptures, that he released the Jews from Egypt, commanded them to serve, to, to celebrate the Passover because they had to sacrifice the lamb in order to not be slain. When the death angel came and then they were told to, to celebrate that each year, was looking forward to the Lamb of God, Jesus, coming for our sins. And then on the very, that same very feast is when Jesus was crucified 
And then he rose on the feast of first fruits. All the feasts that God commanded them to observe looked forward. They were all pro prophetic of what God was going to do. He told us his plan from the very beginning. But now Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. That's why God had to come as a man, sin free, take our punishment, and come back to life to conquer death for us. Because it was by one man that sin came into the world through Adam. Jesus, being referred to as the second Adam, came and took care of that problem for us. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Death is going to be destroyed. And we will be given a new body. And oftentimes when I speak of that, that we're going to be changed, transformed, given a new body. People say, well, what's that going to be like? Because there's some things I don't like about this one. Do I get to change them? But someone will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Are they just going to be spirits? Are they ghosts? What, what are they? Paul says, foolish one, what you sow is not made alive until it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain. So he's using the example of sowing seed. When you sow the seed, that's not what comes forth in life, is it? I put some seeds in my garden. And up they come in the plants. They don't look anything like the seeds. They're more glorious than the seeds. That's what he's telling us. This body that you're going to be great and more glorious. It's going to bear a lot of fruit. It's much, much better than this thing that we have right now. It says perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases. And to each seed its own body. So also in the resurrection of the dead, the body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. So when somebody dies and you put them in the grave, their body corrupts. It goes back to dust. But it's going to be raised in incorruption. A body that won't suffer corruption. Just like Jesus' body didn't suffer any decay. It is sown in dishonor and raised in glory. It is sown in weakness and is raised in power. It is sown in a natural body and is raised in a spiritual body. Now it says it's sown in weakness and raised in power. That means you are sown in sickness, but you're going to come back. You won't be sick. Yes. You won't have any pain. No more. That's a good thing. I mean, sometimes when you get up, you're just you're stretching and pulling because you're full of aches and pains. Depending on what you did the day before, too. My wife, sometimes she, she has this um, war on weeds <laughs> in our property. Certain plants she does not want growing there, especially foxtails, because the horses eat those and it's not good. So she's constantly out. You know, we have acres. And she's out trying to pick, you know, get the foxtails out of there all day long. And she wakes up and they say, oh, I'm so sore. And she goes, I'm so sore. <laughs> when you're raised from the, you won't get sore like that. No, that there won't be any foxtails. <laughs> They'll all be grains. <clears throat> the horses come. Yes. The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Now I say, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. I like the verse. There was a church we went into, and they had this part of this verse up above their nursery. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. <laughs> Think about it. It's a great verse for a nursery. <laughs> 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 but 
But this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that it is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. You know, there's something about it as you get older, this is game here, and I'm not there yet. But I know people, when they get old, they start reading the obituaries a lot. <laughs> Any of you pick up reading the obituaries? You want to see if somebody you know has died. I'm not there yet. Maybe that's a good thing. But I know a lot of older people that, that every day they get the newspaper. Because a lot of people don't get newspapers anymore. <clears throat> but it was just because as you get older, you're thinking, does anybody I know, did, did we lose anybody today? But when death is swallowed up in victory, there won't be any obituaries. The newspapers are going to have to take that section and print something else. Maybe some nice, good stories that we'd like to read. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Health will no longer have a victory. And death will no longer have a sting. Our earthly body is temporary. We will have an eternal body. It will live forever. Do you know we're meant to have a physical body? Your physical body wasn't meant to decay and grow old and get corrupted. That is the wages of sin. That is what sin has brought in. That was not God's plan. And he is... You know, you wonder, well, once we're raised from the dead, we're in heaven, what do we need a physical body for? Well, he wants you to have one. Jesus, when he rose from the dead, he kept his body. But it was a glorified body. And he seemed to have abilities that are beyond what we can imagine. He could enter a locked room without going through the door. In his physical body. Because Thomas doubted whether it was him and or that he rose and he said, I want to see the wounds on him. I want to touch, put my fingers in the holes in his hands and my hand in the spear, where he's pierced with the spear on his side. When Jesus appeared to him, he showed him the wounds. He said, go ahead, Thomas. He kept the scars. Do you know those are the only scars that you'll see in heaven? You know, the only man-made thing in heaven are the scars on Jesus. Why does he keep his scars? To remind us of what he did for all of us. I believe his body could have been risen and the scars healed, but he kept them to remind us. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God. Now it's interesting how he put that. He said, we know that this, when this tent is destroyed, that's this body, we will have a building. Buildings are much more substantial than a tent, are they? You can have abilities that this tent doesn't have. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. I groan every day with pains and aches, waiting for that glorified body. I can't wait. It's like that song we sang, you will live. Waiting for, longing for a place we've never been homesick for a place you've never seen. So we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body than to be present with the Lord. It can only be two places. You're either in this body or when you're absent from this body, you're in the presence of the Lord. Until the resurrection of this body, then you will also have your body. One of the things, just to clear up too, is that the <clears throat> Bible doesn't tell us we're going to spend eternity in heaven. If you die before Christ returns to the earth, you'll spend some time with him in heaven, but then you'll come back to the earth with him. It's God's desire that we, were, that we live on earth with him, with Jesus as the king of the earth. After put in bodies that won't be corrupted. I once did a, a message on the millennium reigns, a thousand year reign of Christ on earth, which will be an interesting period of time because there will also be people on the earth during that time 
to come out of the great tribulation period that we'll be having children. There'll be people that are still living and dying while there'll be a whole bunch of us on the earth that'll be eternal beings that won't die because we'll have access to the tree of life. It'll be an interesting thousand years on the earth. And after that, it says he'll make a new heaven and a new earth. What that means is he's going to put everything back. God will put everything back the way he meant it to be without any corruption. So even in the Old Testament, they spoke of eternal life. You don't find the word eternal life necessarily in the Old Testament, but they spoke about it. Eternal life is a, is a New Testament term. But Job said, and Job is believed to be the oldest book in the Bible, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. So he believed in a resurrection. Because he says, in my flesh I shall see God, after my skin is destroyed. Whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Even Job yearned for that time. Daniel was given a prophecy of eternal life. At that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame, and everlasting contempt. That book is also spoken about in the Revelation, called the Lamb's Book of Life. And those whose names are written in that book will be raised to eternal life with him and not to eternal damnation. There are resurrections that have already happened. So if you still doubt that a resurrection can occur, there are a number of them that did occur in the scriptures. There was the resurrection of the widow's son, Zarephath, in 1 Kings. The resurrection of the Shunammite son in 2 Kings. The resurrection of the man thrown into Elijah's grave in 2 Kings. There was the resurrection of Jairus' daughter in the book of Mark. There was the resurrection of a young man at Nain in the book of Luke. There's the resurrection of Lazarus. There's the resurrection of unknown saints during the crucifixion that I talked about. It says that the graves opened and many rose. There's the resurrection of Christ. Resurrection of Tabitha in Acts. And the resurrection of Eutychus in the book of Acts. And there's also the in Revelation that speaks of the, re the resurrection of all the dead. So well covered in the scriptures. But those are the resurrections of the past. There will be two resurrections in the future that we look forward to. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then he, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So there's coming when Christ returns, there will be a resurrection of the dead first, and then those who are alive when he's coming will be caught up with him in the air. And this is what many call the rapture. It comes from um, the Latin word for being taken away. And in the Greek, it's harpazo, which means to be snatched out with force. And it would be like best description of that word is that if you were standing in the road and the car was coming down ready to hit you and you didn't see it and somebody grabbed you and yanked you out of the way that is the description of the term where we get the word rapture. You're taken out of trouble to meet Christ in the air. Then Revelation 20 it says I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them and then I saw the souls of those that who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image 
and had not received his mark on their forehead or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. The first resurrection being the resurrection of all those before the millennial reign, and then there'll be a second resurrection after Christ comes in the millennial reign on earth, when all that are in the grave will be raised. Um, some, and that's the one that Daniel spoke of, some for um, eternal life, some for condemnation. Believers don't have to wait for eternal life because it's not something that starts when they die. Rather, eternal life begins the moment a person exercises faith in Christ. It is our current possession. Did you know that when you accept Christ as your Savior, you already are living in eternal life? It's not something you have to wait for. You already have it. John 3, 36 says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. Has, meaning right now, not will have. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. In John 10, 10, the second half says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. <coughs> that word in the Greek for eternal life it not only means a quantity of time, but it means a quality as well. So what it means, we have eternal life now in Jesus Christ. We have a quality of life that you would not have otherwise. Does that mean that everything's going to go well and perfect and, and great all the time? No, it doesn't. That's a, a false teaching that, that's being taught too much. And the church is this prosperity thing. Now you accept Christ and everything's going to go great. But what do you say to the person that's, that's been serving Christ their whole life and has had nothing but one problem after another? See, he doesn't promise us that things are going to go great. That's not why we accept Christ as our Savior. It's because he is our Savior. He's saving us from something. Remember I said that the, those of the resurrection will be raised for two reasons. There will be two judgments. There will be a judgment for the believers, and it's a judgment of rewards. Where you are judged by what you did for Christ on earth, and you will be rewarded for that. And there will be a judgment for the unbelievers, where they will be cast into eternal darkness and torment. There is, we'll all be judged. It's just you decide which judgment you want to receive. See, the biggest mistake people make, and, and, and some people kind of get it right, they say, well, God would never send anyone to hell. No, he wouldn't. But there are an awful lot of people that choose to go there. That's their choice. That is never God's choice. His choice is that you have life and you have it more abundantly. His choice is that you are saved. That's why he came. That's why we celebrate today. Because Jesus came to take the punishment that we deserve. I was watching on, I think it was Newsmax, had a special on a doctor talking about the passion of Christ from a medical perspective, what he went through. And this doctor was not a Christian, but he studied all the evidence. And he studied what was written about his, his crucifixion. He studied the, the shroud of Turin that shows the marks of the crucifixion on it. And like a medical examiner, he came to the conclusion, he says, that Jesus suffered more than any man in history by all the things that were done to him. And this doctor became a Christian. Very, I can tell, very devout believer. Because he said, all the evidence is there that not only did he suffer for us, but that he rose from the dead. Eternal life, our next exit. Are you ready? We don't know when we turn off and take that exit beyond this life into the next life. But there's eternal life for everyone. You decide what do you want your eternity to be. It's your decision. God won't make it for you. He will try over and over to get the message to you in different ways. But if you reject him, you can't point your finger at him on judgment day and say, 
You're, you can't do this to me. You can't send me there. The one thing I don't want on Judgment Day is anybody in that line looking over at me and said, why didn't you tell me when you had a chance? So I try to get any opportunity we have, we need to take that opportunity to share our faith with other people. So that's one of the signs of being a true believer. If you truly believe in Christ, you truly believe in what he did for all of you, then why would you not want to share that with someone else? See, it's God's desire that all men are saved. But we are his voice on earth. And I'll tell you right now, sure, some people are going to make fun of you or put you down or think you're, you're weird if you, if you share your faith with, with them. That's okay. The Bible says we're a peculiar people. Go ahead and act peculiar. <laughs> tell them what you believe. Look for those opportunities. You know, people will open doors. We just have to be ready and let God speak through us. How do people open doors? They come up to you and say, man, I am going through a tough time right now, and I don't know what I'm going to do. What would you do in this situation? Oh, wide open door. Yeah. Right. Well, because I have Jesus as my Savior, and I know where I'm going to be someday in eternity, I don't worry about those things anymore. And when those things come along, I turn to Him and I ask Him to help me. See, it's, it's a simple um, but they open you'll find out when they open the door to the list. We need to look for those opportunities. And on this beautiful Easter morning, I'm going to close in prayer and bow your heads for a moment. If you have not accepted Christ as your Savior, nobody can do that for you. They can tell you all about Him. They can share their love with you and his love with you, but you have to open your heart to receive him. The Bible says if you believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, that he died and rose from the dead, and you're willing to confess, confess that to other people, you will be saved. If you did not accept it in today and would like to do that today, I'd like to include you in my closing prayer. Without anybody looking around, the only thing I'll ask you to do is just raise your hand up for a moment so I know who I'm including in the prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you today for this beautiful Easter, Lord. And I ask and I pray, Lord, that you would touch all of us with the word today. Give us that longing that we sang about, to be homesick for that land that we have not seen, that beautiful place where we will be with you in eternity. We look forward to that day when we will be resurrected and receive our glorified body because you prepared the way for us. We thank you for that, Jesus. We praise you for it, Lord. Bless us today, Lord, as we spend our days with family. Bless our time together. Help us to remember why we're getting together. Help us to remember you. I ask this, Jesus, in your wonderful name. Amen.